I want to honor mothers, and uh, typically that includes a special message for mothers. But, you know, I look at the subject that we're covering, and it's about that, well, it's a dirty four-letter word. You ready for it? W-O-R-K. Work. And I thought, wow. I mean, how fitting for Mother's Day. Because what's the saying? A mother's work is... I don't know. A dedicated mother, I don't know any person that worked harder than a dedicated mom. I mean... I have personal experience, you know. I elbowed her during the night to get up with the crying baby rather than getting up myself. Of course, I wasn't nursing either. That was a plus. But, you know, they don't get enough sleep. They work themselves. I, my own wife actually... You know, even when she's sitting down, it's like she's doing something. She's always moving, always working. And so I figured, wow, the subject work, it fits perfectly. And by the way, as we get older, one of the things that we recognize and that we agree with is the importance of staying active, the importance of moving, of being productive even in our older age because inactivity is debilitating and there's a general life principle that i think we can all agree to and that is that inactivity isn't good it's not good for any age we have responsibilities that we're expected to carry out carry and live out the purpose for which god has made you God has not made us to just sit down and take life easy. God has created us to work. You know, I think that uh, some Christians have the strange idea that work is God's curse on mankind. Now, I understand that God did uh, place a curse on man's work. But man was working before there ever was a curse. Before the fall of man in the garden, before sin entered the human race, God created human beings to be workers. He gave Adam the job to not only name all of the animals, if you can imagine that job, but also to, the Bible says, dress and keep the garden. That is, to cultivate it and to watch over it, to supervise it, to guard it. And so I truly believe this. God made us in his image. God's a maker. God's a creator. And if we're made in the, if we are God imagers, then we will reflect his creativity in our lives. And the way that that creativity comes out is uh, by us working, by the things that we do. In fact, I feel sorry for people that can't work because if you're able, but if you can't work, I understand that. But if you're able-bodied and you don't work, you are you're shooting yourself in the foot, so to speak. Because God created us to work, and he intends our work to be a way in which we express the creativity that he gave to each one of us. And when we work, because we're constructed that way by God, it gives us each a, a sense of self-worth, and it gives meaning uh, to life. And when you're done with a job, whether the job be painting or uh, some other craft craftsman job that you do or accounting or whatever it might be in an office. When you finish a job, there is a sense, a feeling of accomplishment. That's what's supposed to happen. That's what work is about. So on this Mother's Day, 
I'm reminded that with motherhood, there's no place for laziness. And no one works harder than them. There was a problem in this church because they had some people that were not workers, but shirkers. They were people that were shirking their work. And as a result, because they didn't have a flow of income, they were expecting other people in the church to take care of their necessities. And that didn't fly. That didn't go well. And so Paul has to deal with this matter of work among these people. I don't know why some weren't working. I don't think they had a welfare system back then. Why they weren't working. Some people think perhaps it was because they believed in the imminent return of Jesus that they thought, okay, then we don't have to work. We'll just, he's coming and he's coming anytime. And so we're just going to wait for him. Well, you always have this lunatic fringe of Christians that, that push Bible truth too far. And as a result, they discredit the truth of God's word. I don't know if that's the reason why these people weren't working, but they created a real problem. What we see in 2 Thessalonians is how to biblically and correctly handle a problem like that. You know, we, we have problems, different kinds, in the church, in our own families, in our lives. The key to problems is to approach them and deal with them biblically. Deal with them God's way and not the world's way and not human thinking uh, uh, way, but God's way. And that's what we see here as Paul deals with this and tells them to stay active. Remember, last week, stay true. This week, stay active is really what he's telling them. So let's pause a moment and we'll jump in, beginning with verse 6, and uh, see what Paul has to say about the problem of inactivity among the people. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we can depend upon you in every area all the time. We thank you for the uh, abilities that you give to each one of us. They're different, but you've given each one of us special abilities. And when we depend upon you to exercise those, those abilities get used to the fullest. And I do pray today that you might uh, open our hearts to what it is that you have to say to us as individuals and that we might uh, receive that and that it might be life changing, even transforming. We're grateful for the fact that you love us so much that you decided to create us. And then because you loved us so much and created us, you don't want to live without us. And Lord, I don't want to live without you. And I know that there are people here that feel the same way. That's why we're here. We can't live without you. So Lord, we pray that you might uh, just keep us faithful and active until you come for us so that we can live with you forever in your presence. Thank you for the promise, the hope, Jesus' name, amen. amen. So what do you do with people that uh, aren't obeying the Lord? Who says, as Paul expresses it in this uh, very chapter in the 10th verse, we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. What do you do with people that won't work? Well, the first thing he says in verse 6, this is harsh, seemingly, but this is the biblical way and God's way, the right way to deal with it. He says you withdraw from them. You withdraw from them. Look at verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother, that's a believer, from every brother that walketh disorderly. That is, not according to what the Bible says. 
not after the tradition which we you, you received of us. And when he talks about tradition, he's talking about what Jesus taught and what his apostles after him taught that is recorded in our Bible. What do you do with people that don't follow biblical truth and specifically in this area in which they are shirkers and not workers? You withdraw from them, he says. You keep away from them. This is a word of warning. Keep away from them. Avoid them. Don't have, uh, have nothing to do with them. Separate yourself. Sever yourselves from them. Now, later on, in the 14th verse, he says, And if any obey not our word by this letter, by this epistle, note that man have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. So, I think what he's talking about here is what we call church discipline. He is actually calling for a, a believer that is disobedient in this area to God's word to be disfellowshipped from that local church. That's harsh in our eyes. But that's what God says to the Apostle Paul. Why? Why would you withdraw from someone that just uh, refuses to work? Well, because of what the Bible says, first of all, in that sixth verse. It's a clear biblical command. It says it again in verse 14. It's a clear command from God's word. It is a command that is weighted with the full authority. Notice what he says there in verse 6. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's the full name and title for our Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. It's an emphasis of his total person. He is deity and humanity in one. And because of that, the full authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as the tradition or the apostles' teaching. Now, this is the first time Paul talked like this. In chapter 2 of the first letter, listen to this. Uh, he says to the Thessalonians, and I, I like all that Paul talks about, but he says this to them. Listen to the way he teaches teaches them in the first letter he says we were gentle among you you think this is harsh language paul says we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherisheth, cherisheth her children literally a nursing mother that bond that special deep bond between a nursing baby or infant and their mother he says that's how gentle we we have dealt with you and treated you. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear. A mother that's willing to give up her life for that nursing baby. That's the tenderness. That's the affection. That's the, the love that Paul feels for these people. And so that's the basis that he can say such what to us is harsh. Stay away from that brother that is not obeying the commands of God's word that is disobedient. In fact, in that uh, 14th verse again, he says, you should note that person that is walking in direct disobedience to God's command. You should note that person. That's a strong word, note. It's not just, it, it means to mark, put a mark on someone, to brand them. You know how they brand cattle? <laughs> to brand that person with disapproval is what he's talking about. Don't avoid confronting them. Note that person, confront them. And then he says, have no company with them in that 14th verse. Don't mix up yourself with them. Don't associate with them. 
isolate them from the rest of the congregation. Why? Look at the last phrase in that 14th verse. Here's why. That he may be ashamed. To cause them to feel shame for their disobedience of the Bible. There's another thing here that uh, Paul tells us to withdraw from those who don't walk in the, in the way that the Lord, the Bible says. And he bases it not only on the Bible, but he bases it upon example, i.e. his own example. In this same third chapter, look at uh, the seventh through the ninth verse. You yourselves know how you ought to follow us. See the word follow there in that uh, seventh verse? It literally means to imitate. You should mimic us. How? Read on. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. We didn't disobey God's biblical command about this matter of work. Verse 8. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught or for nothing. But we wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not the power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us, to imitate us. Now, Paul spoke in detail about how that he, as an apostle, how that uh, ministers of the gospel that are what we would call in full-time gospel ministry have the, the right to be fully supported by the congregation. First Corinthians chapter 9, uh, as the ox that uh, plows the, the corn, he has the ability to eat to his uh, fullness, to his need. The laborer is worthy of his hire is what Paul uh, quotes from Luke's gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. But what Paul is saying here, I let that right that I have, I, I push that aside. I let that uh, forgo because I wanted to set an example. Evidently, there was a real need here in this church for him to set aside <laughs> his, response, his uh, ability to have them support him in order to set an example, model for them. It's right for Apostle Paul. It's right for full-time workers to be supported by a local congregation, obviously. That's not what he's saying. But he chose not to. And I think because it was a problem there, but I think also because he is a pioneer church planter, and he is going into people that have nothing to do with the Bible. They're totally ignorant. They're, they're total idolaters. And so he's bringing people fresh out of total pag paganism without any previous recognition of the value of spiritual truth. And so he is freeing them initially from the responsibility of financially supporting them. It's not that Paul never took financial support from churches. He did. In fact, the whole letter to the Philippian church is a thank you note. And he's thanking them for the support that they sent to him more than once. And other churches, he said, did as well. But here he made a clear example of himself. He wanted them to see here is what needs to take place in this congregation. You need to work. You need a job. You need to take care of your responsibility to, to provide for your needs. So he says withdraw. There's a second thing that he tells these believers that had quit their jobs and were living off the others. In verse 10 through verse 12, he says, Even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. 
For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a full title again, full authority, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. The second thing, how do you handle this biblically? Where people are not following biblical command to work. He said, number one, withdraw from them. Number two, withhold from them. Withhold what? Withhold food from them. From them. Not only withdraw socially from brothers that refuse to work, but withhold food from them. Don't feed them. Let, their, let the hunger pains take over. Let them see that it's not a free ride. It's not what God intends for mankind. Withhold food from them. Oh, that's so cruel. That's what he says. Removal. Notice this, though. In that 10th verse, where he says, if any would not work, neither should he eat. It's not if he can't work, but if he's not willing to work. That's the difference. He can work, but he's not willing to work. Those who purposely avoid work is who he is singling out here. You need to remove the incentive for their idleness. Don't give them food. Remove that incentive from them. You know, you may be aware of the fact of this particular act, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996. It was a, it's a United States federal law. It was passed by the 104th Congress, and it was signed into law by President Bill Clinton. And the law was a cornerstone of the Republican Party's contract with America, and it also fulfilled Clinton's campaign promise when he said he was going to end welfare as we know it. The Aid to Families with Dependent Children program had come under increasing criticism in the 1980s, especially from conservatives who argued that welfare recipients were being trapped in a cycle of poverty. And after the 1994 elections, the Republican-controlled Congress passed two major bills designed to reform welfare but they were vetoed by Clinton. And after negotiations between Clinton and Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, Congress passed this Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. They passed it on August 22nd. It was signed into the law, 1996. After the passage of the law, a number of individuals receiving federal welfare dramatically declined. And the law was heralded as a reassertion of America's work ethic by the chamber of the US Chamber of Commerce. And it was largely in response to the bill's work fair, which said, look, if you are receiving welfare from the United States government, and you have an ability to work in some area or another, then you're no longer going to get welfare if you don't if you have the ability to work and you don't try to work, you don't apply for a job. And it was called work fair, where you were becoming productive. You know, we don't do people a favor by just supporting them if they are able body and can work. This is what Paul is saying here. And you know that saying, idle hands are what? The devil's workshop. Well, I see that very clearly in verse 11, don't you? Look at what it says. Look at your Bible. We hear that there are some which 
walk among you disorderly. That is, they're not working. Instead, working not at all, but now they are busybodies. The lack of work is really the explanation to some degree of the appeal of alcohol and drugs because those substances temporarily deaden the pain because deep down inside of the human being, we know that we're made to work. But I want you to see this. This withholding food is not so that we're cruel, but it's to have a remedial effect. It's to uh, teach them. We withdraw from these disorderly brethren, and we withhold food from these disorderly brethren to prevent them from being busybodies. Verse 11 teaches us. You know what the word busybody means? Literally, it means to work around about. To work round about or to meddle. <laughs> to meddle in other people's uh, business and other people's matters to insert yourself in other people's business that you have no business inserting yourself in and uh, and to stir up difficulty and trouble and distract people busybodies these people were busy all right they were busy doing all they could to try not to work and that's a problem and so Paul is dealing with this. He says, withdraw from them, withhold from them. But the rest of the, uh, of the chapter, verses 13 to 18, here's the third thing. And this I want you to get. With grace. Withdraw, withhold, but do it with grace. Do it with grace. Look at verse 13. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. He is seeking to stir all that needs to be done in this church, but he wants it to be done by grace. Look at the last verse. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. He's seeking to stir all to be done by grace. You know what grace is? Grace is doing God's work, God's way, through God's power. Grace is God's ability, his strengthening us to do what needs to be done. And so he says, deal with these that are disobedient, do it with grace. And so deal with them graciously, of course. And when you deal with people graciously, it may be it may look different than your definition of what graciously means. When you deal with people on the basis of what God defines as love, it may look very different from your definition of being loving. Often we think of love is we just capitulate, we cave in to people. Uh, we give in to their manipulations. But the Bible talks about love. And look at the, the love of God. Can anyone doubt the love of God? And yet look at the things that he allows into our sphere of experience. Look at the situations he allows to develop in our lives, some of which we bring on ourselves, I understand, but some of which we don't. And yet he allows it into our circumstances, our situation. Why? Because he loves us and he knows what's best for us. And difficulty sometimes are the best thing for us. But he says, if you handle it with grace, it'll bring, it'll result in peace. Look at verse 16. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace. God is peace. And he will give you himself and his peace. Always by all means, the Lord be with you all, he says. So we handle it by withdrawing, by withholding, and with grace. First of all, we need grace to endure. Look at the 13th verse. 
Be not weary in well-doing. Literally, don't lose heart. Don't give up on whatever you're called to do. Don't quit. Don't become impatient. Don't tire of counseling and encouraging. You remember, again, what Paul said in the first letter. Toward the closing of that letter in the 15th chapter, he says, We exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Well, that's these guys. And then, unruly meaning not following God's commands. But then he says, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and then the last phrase, be patient toward all men. Toward all men. Those that are following God's commands and those that aren't in the congregation. Be patient toward all. That word patience means long-tempered or long-suffering. Don't be weary in handling this and dealing with this. Instead, be patient toward all men. Be long-tempered towards them. Do it with grace. That's the overall key. And then verse 14, uh, and if any obey not our word by this letter, by this epistle, note that man have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. When you handle this with grace, not only will you endure, but also your goal is to awaken them, arouse their conscience. You don't withdraw from them and withhold food from them to be vindictive towards them, but actually in doing so, you help them. You're actually being helpful to them. You say, well, whoa, that's not my definition of help. Isolating myself from them and not giving them food. Well, that's God's definition, but it's not done vindictively. He says, do this, withdraw and withhold, do it with grace so that they, their consciences are pricked, so their consciences are awakened, so their consciences are, are, are cause them to feel shame. So they realize and they admit, you know what? I shouldn't be living this way. I can't live this way. I have to change. I need to change course here. So when you do it with grace, you awaken them. You, it's your desire for them to wake up. You're not living right. This doesn't glorify God. This has to change in your life. That he may be ashamed. And then just to tie it all together in the 15th verse, he says, yet... Count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. To me, that speaks of brotherly love. Don't carry it out too far and make this individual that is disobedient to the Bible, to the word of God, and really is a bad testimony in the local church. Don't carry it too far and make him feel like an enemy but practice tough brotherly love on this person with this individual. Tough brotherly love. Confront this individual by withdrawing and withholding from him. But don't count him as an enemy. He's a brother in Christ. There's love. You know, sometimes parents have to practice tough love. Sometimes children get to a point where they are you know, legal age or whatever, and they're still living at home, but they're living their life in an ungodly fashion. And parents have to say, look, I'm not going to house you if you're going to live for yourself and for the world. I'm not going to condone that type of behavior. My wife and I have done our part, though I admit imperfectly, to bring up our children in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. As parents, we've not approved of all their behaviors, but 
we've always assured them that they can count on us to give them unconditional love. Although we may have to exercise tough love, we never close the door to reconciliation. Thankfully, we haven't had to deal with this at this point, but we may sometime in the future. None of us are perfect, and we certainly aren't perfect parents. But like this, you may not know this, you younger people, but like the old Motel 6 commercial, where he closed the commercial, and he said, this is Tom Bodell for Motel 6, and we'll keep the light on for you. <laughs> We made it clear to our kids, you may have to leave, but we'll always keep the light on for you. There's always a, a way back. One of the major metaphors in the Bible that God develops is the family. And I say this not in a, in, in a, um, a demeaning way. God is a family man. He's the one that devised the family, but he himself has a family. He has a heavenly family made up of heavenly hosts, and he has an earthly family made up of blood-bought children of God. So God, he believes in the family. And to believers, uh, God's not merely our creator. Oh, he's that. But he's our father. He's our He's our father. We're his, his precious children that he, he bought for himself by the sacrifice of his one and only unique son. So he would be able to forgive us our sin and our debt. And when you receive Jesus, you're welcomed into his eternal family. And that makes believers, Christian brothers and sisters, makes us brothers. We're spiritually sibling, we're spiritual siblings, making up God's family. And as siblings, we have personal responsibility to each other to exercise tough love within the family, but always to leave the light on. Sometimes churches have to practice discipline like this and separate themselves from a disorderly brother or sister in the Lord. But it's not so that you get rid of them. It's so that they feel shame and they come back to the family and they feel the loss and they're drawn back to the Lord and to the family of the congregation that they're a part of. <clears throat> That's what all this is about. We, we, we see it from just a, a soft, uh, fleshly, worldly, human viewpoint. But listen, God knows what works and God knows what real love is. There are parents that would never spank their child. God says, you don't love your child, then you hate them. If you refuse to spank your child, you hate your kid. No matter how much you might have convinced yourself that you love them too much to spank them. No, the Bible says you hate your son if you don't spank him. You see, our love is quite different from God's love. And so God chastens those whom he loves so that they might be better off than they ever were before. Might be partakers of his holiness, because remember this, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And he wants, he wants us to see him. He wants us to be. You know, I was reading this morning. In my regular scheduled reading, I happen to be in John 14. And I never have been moved by those first three verses as I was this morning. Honestly, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, Jesus says, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there. And the thought just hit me, Lord, you want me that bad to be with you? You want me to know that? And you, you want me really that bad that you told me it's okay, I'm going to go away. But don't worry, I'm coming back for you. Because I want you to be with me forever. 
I'll tell you, when that hit me, I had to hit my knees and just worship. What an amazing God. He wants to live with me? She doesn't want to live with me all the time. <laughs> he wants to live with me. He wants to live with you. What a privilege. This is our creator, who is our father. Can I put it this way? He can't live without us. God can't live without you. And he proved it because he, he killed his own son. He drove the knife in his own son's heart for you. He can't live without you. That's his love. That's his overflowing love. That's a love you and I can never, ever match. He loves you. He wants you in his family. But if you're in his family, he spanks us. I've been spanked a lot by the Lord, and it's so good for me. And that's what this is all about. Withdraw and withhold. Do it with grace because it's all remedial. It's because I love you, and I want you to, to walk right so I can really pour out my blessing in your life. That's what I want to do. I want to be with you, and I want to pour out my blessing in your life. So this is why it seems harsh to us, but it's not. It's the best thing. It's God's love. Any questions about that? You've been questioning his love? You've never been loved like this. Mm -hmm.